The human body is a finely tuned machine, the likes of which, after a medical revolution leading to what we call modern medicine and science, essentially, we still really don't fully understand it. Sure, we know how to sort of chuck antibiotics and antiviral medication at any attacking diseases, and even to a certain degree fight cancers by damaging the DNA of fast-growing cells. But there are other more insidious ailments that have no cure, no treatment, and the only prognosis is, well, sorry man, you're kind of screwed. To that end, we as a species continue to work to rectify these problems, and we may be on the cusp of unlocking the ability to attack these diseases our own meat suits come up with. Enter Fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, also affectionately known as Stone Man Syndrome. This illness affects only about 800 people in the world currently, and thankfully it's incredibly rare. But sort of like the uh, double-edged sword of that is unfortunately, this has had the added effect of making it a relative unknown, which in turn, doctors can inadvertently exacerbate the symptoms and cause it to speed up. So what happens if proteins are allowed to just kind of do their own thing and run rampant despite their necessity at an earlier point in life? Well, let's talk about that in today's episode. So what is fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva? Well, essentially it's an incredibly severe and debilitating as well as disabling disease that works its way through your connective tissues. Any damage a person may suffer from movement or trauma or really anything that causes a cell to undergo apoptosis, which is basically living, will cause in turn the connective tissue to form bone. All over the body, this disease has the ability to progress until it locks down all the muscles, tendons, ligaments, and really anything that is considered connective tissue and turn it into solid bone. Things like moving your head, moving your arms, walking, all become impossibilities. Imagine it like trying to bend your forearm in half. So here is the elbow and here is the wrist. You have a radius and all the bone in there and it just, it, it's not gonna bend, it's not supposed to. So this is essentially what happens to your knees when they try to bend or your ankles when they try to bend. It's just an impossibility. So as you could probably guess, when you have this, it makes walking very difficult. A person with this disease can usually expect to have a lifespan that's really not that long. Typically expected survival rate is about roughly 40 years. That said, should the person undergo trauma, not seek a doctor for their worsening movement, or continue to ignore their difficulty breathing, this can significantly decrease their expected years. As this disease continues to repair the body, a person will slowly but surely become fused in place, making it more and more difficult to breathe. However, while alive, a person will typically position themselves in a way they would like to assume for essentially the rest of their lives. As they maintain this position, it is important not to turn their head or move as they may ultimately become stuck in an awkward, uncomfortable position for quite literally the rest of their lives. So I want you to think about something right now. And this is absolutely something that is the worst I could imagine. So astronauts actually have Velcro inside of their helmets so they can scratch their noses because it was a big issue when they would go out and do spacewalks or even the ones on the moon that they couldn't scratch their noses and it was driving people crazy. People actually with this disease cannot ever scratch their nose. It, not fun. So where does this disease come from? Well, there is a mutation within the gene known as ACBR1. This gene is specifically responsible for the repair of fibrous tissue within our bodies. Anytime you go lift, go for a run, or use your muscle at all, you do a certain amount of damage to it. Now your body is fairly used to this as that's literally the whole point of having muscle. It's supposed to break down so you can rebuild it. The various mechanisms in place swoop into action, cause cells to self-destruct should they be damaged, fill it with new healthy cells, and perhaps even more nuclei, and then increase the size of the muscle strands, which make your body more apt to deal with this stressor in the future. But the key here is apoptosis. When a cell undergoes apoptosis, a proteolytic cascade of effects take place, which amplify the signal to burst. The cell obliges, and then that's it. No more damaged cell. A person with Stone Man Syndrome, however, has proteins in place that should have been switched off but they have continued to operate. These proteins react to cells undergoing apoptosis. Now, this bone isn't sort of like bone, it is bone. The cells turn from endothelial cells to mesenchymal cells, which are, as you know, stem cells, and then ultimately they will become pure bone. So how does it work? Well, due to the genetic mutation they possess, this is a far-reaching implication. When you first form in the womb, where do your bones come from? Well, a protein within the cell to request bone formation is then sent out. After, lymphocytes arrive on the scene and provide the cell with bone morphogenic protein 4, or BMP4, 
As a fetus, this protein is responsible for the formation of your skeletal system, with certain cells becoming almost like the scaffolding. As you age and grow, the scaffolding remains in place while certain areas of your skull are fully fused as well as other areas of your bones. Like if you've ever seen a baby skeleton before on x-ray or anything, it looks a lot different than an adult's. It looks way underformed, I guess is the best way to put it, because it literally isn't bone. It's just more the scaffolding in place to create bone. Well, eventually, however, an inhibitor is supposed to be quite prevalent to stop the releasing of this protein, or at least bind with this protein and then inhibit it from functioning, which kind of creates this bone formation. And those with this mutation, this inhibitor is never made and thus protein is free to be released. And this is where the problems begin to arise. With your body naturally not producing this inhibitor, the body does what it does, listens to the cells based on chemical and hormonal signaling, and is like, okay, cool, bro, heavy bone coming up, even though that is an intercostal muscle and there's not supposed to be bone right there. This in turn causes the cell to revert to a stem cell and then ultimately into an osseous cell or just bone. Over time, cell by cell, strand by strand, muscle group by muscle group, it slowly changes the body restricting movement. However, you may be wondering, why don't people just completely drop from this disease? After all, cardiac muscle is a muscle, right? Well, interestingly enough, it does not appear as though autonomic muscle seems to be affected quite the same way as voluntary muscles. The diaphragm, tongue, and extraocular muscles do not suffer the same fate as say your biceps, triceps, you know, et cetera, everything else. The cardio muscle, thankfully, does not get repaired to bone either, as this would mean the lifespan would probably be impacted severely and you wouldn't really even make it outside of a year in terms of survival. Now it should be noted that the voluntary muscles of the eyes, like the diaphragm, which by the way, you're manually breathing, um, all of those are technically voluntary. Uh, they just aren't affected the same way. So are there any ways to identify this disease before these people grow up and just get totally stuck? Oddly enough, when a child is born, a misshapen big toe or enlarged joint is the easiest way to find this mutation. This is known as their first flare-up, which is an active transitioning from muscle to bone. From here, keeping the child away from trauma and injuries is the best chance at giving them the longest life possible. Because as these flare-ups continue, more joints will lock, and as mentioned previously, some people will choose a position to be in for really the rest of their lives. So some choose standing, whereas some choose sitting, making it easier to use like wheelchairs, but the standing people have an easier time laying down. Both have pros and cons, as you can imagine. Stoneman syndrome is considered to be an autosomal dominant disorder. It means that it can be inherited from parents as one has it and the other doesn't. Or even if both parents don't have the disease, you can still inherit it. And usually kids will have their first flare between the ages of about zero to 10. So you should have a first flare like before 10. So if you don't have it yet, congratulations, you don't have it. But one of the kind of terrible things about this disease is symptoms can be made worse by doctors ordering biopsies to the area to rule out cancer. This in turn can create more bone growth. But something to freak you out, which is pretty alarming, most cases of Stoneman syndrome occur from new mutations which means there is no past history of this disorder in the family, but they are the first to exhibit this lack of inhibiting protein. But again, if you're over the age of 10, you're probably okay. So how might this disease be treated? Trying to remove the new bone growth does way more harm than good. As you cut through muscle, the body is repaired faster and more bone is just kind of forced into the muscle in this area. So that's just it's a no-go on that front. One idea is introducing the inhibitory protein within the body, but then the issue remains that it may not properly get into cells, meaning that it's really not gonna help that much. And if your body isn't producing it, it's just not gonna work. So honestly, I really only see, and I mean, I am not researching this disease actively, so uh, I'm not in a lab right now, but just by using logic, I think the best way to actually stop this disease from progressing is an old favorite, and I talk about it constantly in this channel. It's gonna be CRISPR. CRISPR possesses the ability to correct the mutation within the gene itself, and gives the body the ability to make a code, or at least read the code in its own genes for the inhibitory protein. It would take a while and considering the body also has a bad habit of fixing what's fixed, making it broken again. And we are finding uh, doses of CRISPR are really necessary for continued maintenance in a lot of areas. This would still seem like the best way, at least from my perspective. And the reason is, once again, I use the analogy, if you wanna fix a house with foundation issues, you don't just fix the siding, you fix the foundation and then you fix the siding. If you can repair the gene mutation, then the body produces the inhibitory protein properly, then you could go in and do surgery on the body to remove the excess bone. Now, would the muscle repair afterwards? 
probably unlikely, but it would give a person a much more normal lifespan and they would not lock up. One thing I did want to mention before we end this video though, is that the protein does turn regular cells into stem cells. Now I need to do a hell of a lot more research into what mesenchymal stem cells are, but that is an interesting process as it could be harnessed before becoming bone cell because then you have your own genetic material in a stem cell ready to be used where you need it. And I mean, I'm just kind of thinking out loud on this one, but having a possibility of the body which we know there are stem cells in humans anyways, even adults, but having these stem cells be created from regular cells, the implications of that, I think could be pretty good. Anyways, I wanna thank you guys for watching. If you enjoy, leave a like, as that would be cool, and subbing is a good way to stay up to date on what I post. So see, I told you, we're back on this channel. I'm trying to put out weekly videos on some diseases, but I'm also thinking about some other science in the future, as I've actually always enjoyed astronomy. And actually, believe it or not, uh, my first year of college, I got into a school for aerospace engineering for a while in an attempt to be an astronaut. I'm still on that path. I just chose to go with the biology route as opposed to the engineering route as I'm okay at math, but as you guys saw, one of the videos I put uh, back out a little while ago, sometimes my math is a little off. But all right, guys, I appreciate y'all watching. Uh, like I said, if you enjoyed, just leave a like, and I'll see everyone in the next one.